Good afternoon, everyone. It's nice to see everyone. Welcome to the Cedar Woolley Rotary Club, the greatest club in the... All right, we have an invocation by Eric today. So um, let's take a moment to bow our heads and a uh, moment of silence for those that have lost their lives, their businesses, and their homes on Maui. And now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and give you his grace. And the Lord lift up his countenance and share his peace with you. Amen. Amen. Pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, the four-way test. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? And our very own rock star, Josh, has a song for us today. Uh, so I was going to sing Bow Down to Washington today, but then I remembered who our guest speaker was. And so you probably saw the, the vehicle out in the parking lot. So, um, you know, it's been cloudy all week, and I want that sunshine to come back. So let's sing, You Are My Sunshine. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy with skies of gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine. Nicely done. Okay. Do we have any visiting Rotarians today? Do we have any guests? Oh, all right. Oh, hold on. Uh, we got to get you a mic, John, or else no one on Zoom can hear you. Niall, please stand up. Niall is my master in chainsaw carving. And uh, we've done a really good job, had a good time, and so I invited him to lunch. Thank you. Chris, up at this front table, I have a guest today. It, this is Ann Bain. She's from the Super Bowl Alliance Club, and she just has a quick announcement for us. Thank you very much for allowing me to come in today. I have a poster that advertises the Alliance Club golf tournament, which is titled Take a Swing at Diabetes. All funds that come into us for this tournament will go to our foundation, our newly formed foundation. We're now a 5013C, allowing us to do more things. And so just looking for players, anybody golfer in here interested in playing for a good cause, would love to have you. And I have, along with that, I have a little, uh, just a sheet, a descriptor of the, how this will be handled, how the funds would be referred and Hand it out, and also, do you have any questions about the log roll? How we did with the log roll this year? The float, I mean, excuse me, float. 15 hours, and I can't remember how many minutes, Mark Torset said he had to pull it off of so many sandbars, it was just hanging up, it was so low. 
And that was the, the problem. It just stayed in. I know I tried to average out all those years. Oh, this is pretty good, but it was wrong. And um, they, we raised about $2,700 and two, there were two winners and they elected to have all their money go to the Children's Cancer Fund as well as everything we made. So that was a very successful venture. But we had to file also for a gambling permit for that. And the state takes a long time sometimes to get the paperwork through. And it kind of, we didn't have a lot of time to sell a lot of tickets, but next year, yes, we will be out with tickets way before it's the due date. Thank you very much. I'll leave the poster and the paperwork here and uh, it's all online. It's very easy. And uh, any questions, feel free to call. Yes. 923-23, it's a Saturday. I say it that way because it's easy for me to remember. Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it a lot. And have a great meeting today. Oh, okay, do we have any other guests? <clears throat> okay, so club business, summer concert. Oh, Phil. Oh, no, I, I know. They're coming up next in the program. Don't worry. I got I got them, Phil. Yes. Um, Chris, did you want to say anything about the summer concert series? Uh, we've had the final concert last Sunday. Um, amazing turnout. Um, man, every week was just amazing turnout. Um, probably, I'd say, you know, 30, 40% more people than even showed up last year. So um, we raised, I'm not exactly sure what the final count was for uh, raising funds through the raffle for the museum. Do you know? Just under $2,000 raised by our community for, for the museum. Um, we had some great vendors. Um, I put out a, a big thank you out on, on Facebook, um, but I'll also be doing separate posts and, and thank yous for all of our sponsors and everything. All in all, it was a great year. We learned a lot. Um, for next year, we'll, we'll be raising some a little extra funds for health department, per, uh, health department permits and, and different things that we came across this year for the first time. So um, like I said, it's always a learning experience and, and we had a great time. All right. Thanks, Chris. I also have a thank you note from the Cedar Rolling Museum. Uh, all of the funds that they raised in those raffles are going towards their, um, their funds to replace the roof. So those dollars are all going to a very good cause. So thank you guys for going and showing up. The bands were fantastic this year, Chris. So thank you for putting that together. Um, next, we have fun and fellowship at the fair tonight. If you have your tickets, I'll see you there. Uh, you're probably going to find Ruth with the goats and the goat costume contest. And I'm going to be watching the local cheerleaders who will take the main stage at 4.30. So uh, I hope to see you there. Then on August 24th, the Cedar Rolling School District is putting on their second annual reading and resources. Uh, it's not under the lights this year, it's on the field because there are some scheduling things. But Rotary is going to be handing out tickets for books. The board decided on Tuesday that we are going to um, we are going to give up to $2,000 to purchase books for the kids who attend. So um, we'll have a booth there. We're going to be passing out tickets. So any kiddo that comes and gets a ticket from us, will be able to go to the Scholastic Book Fair that's going to be on site and get a, a $5 book courtesy of the club. So if anyone wants to attend and hit, uh, sit at the booth with me and hand out tickets to the kiddos, let me know. It should be a really fun event. Ruth said that they had well over 800 people come last year. So it's a really big community event. So it would be great if you guys could come and lend a hand. And August 31st, there's not a noon meeting. We're going to be meeting at five at Barley and Brew, which is one of the newer businesses in town. It was the old local 20, but we're going to have uh, an evening social there. So We'll have snacks and appetizers. You can bring your dogs and we'll just enjoy some fellowship on the fifth Thursday. August 31st. So no noon meeting on August 31st. And then finally, we have a very special guest here today. Uh, 
our former Rotarian, Dave Mercer, is here with his daughter, Alyssa. Um, Alyssa was one of our scholarship recipients this year, and when we had our other meeting where we had the scholarship winners come, she wasn't able to make it, but she's here today. So today we are going to recognize Alyssa and all her hard work and just send another congratulations to her uh, for for graduating and moving on. So I'm going to give the mic to Alyssa. If you want to say a couple words, let us know about what your plans are. Um, I will be going to WSU and studying nursing and then hopefully playing club, club ball over there because they don't have a uh, Pac-12 team. Well, not anymore. <laughs> and then um, depending on that, after two years at Pullman, I'll transfer to Spokane because the hospital in Pullman is too small to do clinicals. Thank you guys. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you for joining us today, Alyssa. And it's good to see you, Dave. We, we would love to have you come back if you, if you feel so inclined. Um, all right. So do we have any other club business? I know Brock has an announcement. Let's get him a mic. Okay, Nick is not here, so I'm going to make the announcement for the uh, Rotary Golf Tournament coming up on September the 7th, so that's a Thursday. It, uh, it's going to start around 4 o'clock if, if you want to get there early uh, or later. You just Whenever you get there is when you go out. It's a two-person tournament, so we've got some people already signed up, um, and uh, I don't know if Travis is on, not on here yet, I don't think. Aldi, you're not on here yet. You know, here you go. You need to sign up. We've got six teams so far. We need a lot more than that. And then also the barbecue starts at the after the tournament's over. And um, anybody can come for that. So there's a spot to sign up just for the barbecue. So, all right. I did. After. Yeah, this is a different barbecue. This is the barbecue just for the, at the, uh, at the golf tournament. So... Yeah, so don't get that mixed up. So Cheryl's doing the catering, I believe, for the uh, golf tournament barbecue. All right, sign that up. I need to leave early, so here's five bucks for that. And sorry, I won't be able to save for the program. Brock, you mean you didn't want to stay and hear the WSU presentation? Oh. Okay, do we have any other announcements? Okay. Yeah, so Carl, we flip-flopped the dates this year. The salmon barbecue is on the 14th, the second Thursday in September. And mostly that was because of Nick. Nick's not here, so we can blame him for that But um, in the golf tournament. But yeah, so the 14th is coming up fast already. We're already starting to make arrangements for, um, you know, getting the fish and hopefully we get some good fresh king salmon this year, right? All right, thank you. Um, if there are no other announcements, I believe we have a raffle. Uh, we did quite a few, so, so should we do four? <clears throat> oh. Slippery. All right, hey, the year I was born, 1974, 74. Yeah, all right, Mike. You want me to deliver something to you? No. Guys or gals, pay. Two bucks. Hey, Carl wanted to point out that we have some vegetables here for the raffle, so it's not just alcohol this time, or you can spend like Mike did. So. 
All right, number 14, one four. Eric. Yeah, guys paid two bucks for the last one there. Uh, number 57, five, seven. 57, John, is that you? 57? Oh. Is it me? Dad, that's you. 57, right there. Right there in front of it. Jeez. Hey, how's driving? $25. All right. Good one, Dad. That's a good one. All right, last one, number 53, 5'3". Five, Mark Nielsen. Oh, yeah. Cougs pay today. <laughs> Donnie, you're not off the hook. All right. Um, before we move on to Sergeant of Arms and let Sandra take control of the mic, I wanted to give uh, the folks on Zoom, Maggie, Don, Kate, Becky, Danny, and Ellen, a chance to uh, to give some happy bucks if they had any. So anyone on Zoom right now want to? Are they? Are you, is anyone on Zoom happy about anything? I guess that should be my question. Danny's happy. Danny's happy. My husband's home from Ohio for a few days, so I'm happy about that. Yay. Um, I have some bittersweet bucks. Um, my grandmother um, died yesterday, and so I'm I'm sad that she's gone, but I'm I'm happy that she's no longer suffering. So um, I'm gonna do twenty bucks for that. All right, thank you, Maggie and Danny, Sandra. The mic's all yours. Now it's on. Yeah. Feeling a little feisty, guys. Just want you to know. All right, we got some veggies up here. Um, it looks like I see some kale. I saw a strawberry. How many strawberries are in there? Just the one? It's, it's massive. It's, it's like a massive strawberry. Um, I see some uh, green peppers. A yellow squash, some yellow tomatoes, and a cuke. And I'm going to raffle them off. All right. Oh, yeah. Well played. I love this job. All right, so now it's time for some fines. Um, who's going to the fair tonight? Raise your hand. Everybody else put a buck on the table. Fellowship, people, we've got to do fellowship. I'll, I'll put my buck on the table too. I'm taking bartending class tonight, so I can't go. Um, who's a Husky in the room? Huskies, raise your hand. Oh, $2 right now. Leaving the pack, ten, pack 12 OMG. <laughs> I'm a Husky and I'm pissed, all right? I'm a Husky, my daughter's a Husky. Yeah, but, you're, but you gotta pay. And I, if I could have you give the money directly to the Cougars, I'd do it. Take that $20 million and spread it back to the Cougars. All right, happy bucks. So let's just make our money with happy bucks. I'll start, because I have the mic. I got a kitten today. And, and she's like this big. And she's so freaking cute. So I'm, I got a happy 20 I'm going to put in the um, thing. So who else has happy? I see Lynn was back here. And Keith, hold on. 
Gotta talk into the mic. Mine's real quick, just 10 bucks. I didn't have to pay for lunch, so it's a cheap day today. Where do we collect? I paid for 10 bucks. I'll pay 10. Okay, I have not had a wife for most of the year, but she's finally home. So I can find my keys and wallet now, and I'm glad she's back. We're going to find more. We don't, have, we don't get real happy real quick. So I've got uh, $9, $9 here, what's left. So on Tuesday, I made an announcement that um, the Gurney Tourney 2.0 uh, raised $9,000 for the Brian uh, Gurney Memorial Scholarship uh, under the auspices of uh, BEEF, the Burlington Edison Alumni Foundation. And we did it on that day specifically because that was the ninth anniversary of the day Brian fell. Uh, uh, and so it's kind of a weird day and we're just so excited and elated that, that so many people have, have supported our family in this scholarship. And uh, it's really, really a cool thing that we're gonna be able to carry his uh, his uh, name on and memory on. But what's really cool is after after we made the announcement, we got three hundred fifty more dollars. So uh, I'll be donating at, as of right now nine thousand three hundred fifty dollars, um, and we're just we're just overwhelmed. So thank you everyone who participated in that. Talking in the mic. I have uh, the rest of mine. Happy bucks. Uh, some had some good friends come up this week. Stayed with us. John took us, and Niles took us through the company. Known John forever, and I think that's the first time I've been through the whole system to get to see. It. I still don't know what's going on. I think I walked in there for about the first two minutes. I was lost. But my buddy Dan is a CT teacher down in New Nahalem, Oregon. Teaches at a little school down there, so we had a good time. Got to hang out with some of our friends the other another night, which he had a blast at. He's gone home now. Um, be really happy if my littlest, youngest daughter has her baby here in about two minutes. She's a little bit overdue and uh, miserable. So hopefully she'll have that done. Although not today, because today is actually her birthday. So. All right. Yes, Mike. So this is a couple hope bucks. Uh, we're, uh, I'm, sent, I'm meeting with the city tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock to explain to them why we shouldn't have to pay impact fees on the bathrooms out there at the ball fields. And uh, um, I hope they understand that if they don't say yes, we're gonna have 500 mad women with their children in every meeting until they decide that this is a good idea because they're tired of using the porta potty. That, that's your management plan? Hey, hey, you just a minute. You, 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 um, you killed 400 innocent fish, and, and all I get is two bucks. Come on, let's go get some money out. You keep the mic. Wow. Who are you going to shame at this table? Because this table hasn't happy yet. Yeah, I mean, they're just nice. I don't see any money on the table or anything. And, you know, just I got to get some money out of this table first, Julia. Yeah, who's happy? Thank you. I'm happy because every day I get my daily dose of Maya. Maya is our granddaughter. And thank goodness for the internet and connectivity. So we get a little video clip every day. And today she learned how to do this. That was a big thing. That's worth five bucks. Julia, coming around. No, I'm not going to respond to the comment about the permits. I actually have happy bucks because tomorrow our son is getting married and we are very excited about that. So I won't be there to debate with you tomorrow, but I'm sure you'll be able to come up with a good. <laughs> very cool. hey. I need somebody happy here, guys. Somebody come up with something happy. Thank you. Otherwise I fail. I am happy because I get to watch my daughter perform tonight at the fair with the rest of the cheerleaders. Oh, she's very fun, very fun. She's, she's promising to Venmo, you guys. Daryl's giving you cash. Oh, he's giving, here's this cash too. 
All right, last call for happy. You're gonna regret it. You're gonna go home and think, damn, I forgot to tell him about that happy thing. I only have $4, so those are four happy dollars. But um, as most of you know, uh, I just, I am, I'm gonna have my first classroom this year. And so I just, out of the suggestion of a fellow teacher, I put my Amazon wish list for some classroom supplies on there. And I'm very happy and I was actually very overwhelmed with the generosity of people that I would never expect to get anything from. Um, uh, like somebody that I went to high school with and haven't seen for 20 years sent me an Amazon package and told me congratulations. So I'm very happy about that. I, um, I have faith in humanity, but like it was just extra nice to, to get that support from, from people that I didn't expect from. So I'm happy. People are good. Yes. Okay. So that's it. No more happy. Cool. Okay. Well, that was nice job, Sandra. I think that with her efforts, we might have just paid for the barbecue, maybe. <laughs> um, I'm going to uh, have Josh come up. He is going to introduce today's program. So take it away, Josh. Okay, so Don McMorrin is here today. He's probably a familiar face to most of you. He's been here, what, three or four times now? at least three, um, as far as I can remember. The last time he was here, I think it snowed about a foot that day or the night before, and it was right after Christmas, and we didn't have a very good turnout. So this is much better today, and we have some folks online too. So um, I call him Donnie. I know him as Donnie McMorrin. Um, we go way back to our high school days. Uh, he couldn't decide if he was a tiger or a bulldog, right? So maybe you should have come to see Dooley, Donnie. I think our wrestling team could have really used you. Um, so he's well rooted here in the valley. Um, family goes back generations, just like ours, like mine, um, and uh, you know, well known in the in the in the farming you know community. And he's going to talk to us a little bit about uh, what he does at the WSU Extension here in Skagit County as the director. And he's been the director for 18 years, right, Donnie? Wow, time is flying. So uh, please give it up for Donnie McMorrin. Thank you. Well, thanks, Josh. It's a pleasure to be here today. And so I want to chat a little bit about large scale commercial agriculture, talk a little bit about the crops that we're producing here in the valley, um, as well as what we do. So um, a little bit about WSU and, and how things got created. Um, in 1862, uh, Congressman Morrill uh, came up with an act to create um, the, the research side of of the land grant mission, which is um, getting information to everyone, right? And so President, President Abraham Lincoln actually signed this act into law. And he said at that time that he was creating a university for his people. Um, and so there's lots of interpretations on that, but I'll give you mine and you can debate with me later on. But I take it as uh, he was creating it for the blue collar people of the United States. So President Abraham Lincoln was a, a wrestler. He came from rural areas. So I kind of have a lot in common with the guy um, and, and think that he created a system that, that really leveled the playing field for, for the average person and the average farmer in our country. Uh, fast forwarding into 1914, when we had the Smith-Lever Act come um, and, and those congressmen decided that the land grant system was good, but it wasn't getting all the way out to rural areas. And so they created the extension system. And we're very fortunate in Washington state that we have a very strong extension program. There's an office in every county, um, including two tribal designations for extension programs. So anyone in the state of Washington can go to their local extension agent, to the local extension office and get free information on how to deal with problems within your community. Um, so for us uh, here in at Skagit County, uh, we started our extension program in 1922. So we just celebrated our 100th year anniversary last year. Um, and that was a great party. And several of you in the room were able to join us. 
Uh, for my office, we have about 20 staff. So we have programs in agriculture, natural resources, uh, small farm Latino outreach, uh, entomology, livestock advisors, shore stewards, master gardeners, forest stewardship, consumer sciences, food access, food sense, nutrition education, as well as 4-H youth. And I saw that many of you are going to the fair tonight. Make sure you support those 4-H kiddos. Um, I always ask the question, how many 4-Hers do we have in the room? Raise your hand. Perfect. And then I always ask if any of those 4-Hers ever did time in the jail. And usually the answer is no, but one time somebody said, yeah, I did time in the pen. Um, so I kind of quit asking that question. But um, nonetheless, you know, we built a very expensive jail system here in Skagit, and most of the people in it are not 4-Hers. So I think the little bit of money tax money that goes to the 4-H program here in Skagit does a lot of goodwill uh, for, for keeping people out of that system. So uh, for us, our mission statement is to engage people, organizations, and communities in the advancement of and economic well-being um, and, uh, and quality of life by connecting them to knowledge. That's my job. And then uh, doing that through uh, fostering inquiry learning and the application of research. So it's a very broad topic. Somebody asked me what I do, I try to narrow it down and say I bring information from the university to the people of Skagit County. So for that, you know, that puts us here in Skagit. It's a very special place and I know you all are aware of that. Um, but what makes it really special is, is the growing region here and the maritime climate. It's like very few other places in the world. Um, and so with that, I'm going to talk a lot about acres, and I realize that not all of you went to land-grant universities. There's probably a buck, a happy buck, if anybody knows how many square feet are in an acre in this room. All right, I'll pay a buck for that. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, 43,560 for those of you that didn't go to a land-grant university, it's about the size of a football field without the end zones. So. Uh, starting at number 14 on the list is cucumbers, used to be a huge production area, um, and I like to tell the story of Nally's Pickles. So next time you're in the grocery store, go to the pickle aisle, pick up a bar, jar of, of Nally, Nally's Pickles, on the front of it, it will say flavor of the Northwest. Then turn the package over, and on the back you'll see it says product of Mexico and India. So that's really what happens to a lot of our production here in Skagit County. Things have gone away. It's cheaper to do things in other countries. Um, and that's a trend that we're probably gonna continue to see. Um, but with that, there was a time when tariffs were being talked about and some of these pickle companies are now talking about moving back to the United States and they're actually looking at producing here in the Skagit County. Uh, for us, we have one remaining pickle producers, that's Gilo Pickles. They're located right next to my office at the Port of Skagit. Um, somewhere around the range of 400 acres of pickles that are produced here locally, and they all go out to food service. So you might be getting them in a restaurant scenario, but you can't buy them in a grocery store. Uh, raspberries is number 13 with around 250 acres, uh, just under a million dollars of production. Another one that's really fallen off here in Skagit, used to be a lot of raspberry production, but we did pick up a good amount of root rot and it makes it more difficult to produce this crop. Conversely, our friends in Whatcom County, um, they are the number one county for raspberry production in the whole United States. So um, just kind of interesting how terrain and, um, and soils can make or break a crop and for raspberries, it's more or less broken us. Uh, number 12 is strawberries at 450 acres, around a million dollars of production. Another one that we used to produce a lot of, and everybody had a small amount of strawberries in production at one point in time. Uh, we've since lost the, the producers, the major um, uh, processors of strawberries uh, that was located in Burlington. So we just have Sakuma Brothers that still do a little bit of processing of strawberries, but they've largely switched to blueberries. Um, as that crop produces more, it's easier to pick, pick um, using me mechanical harvesters. And, um, and 
So this one has fallen off as well. Uh, then we go into number 11, which is beans, which is a kind of a new crop for Skagit County. Um, we're seeing a lot more production of dry beans. Uh, so this is a great rotational crop specifically for our farmers that produce potatoes in that they like to do a four year rotation. Um, they grow potatoes, then they want to plant a grain afterwards, and then they want to plant some sort of a legume that will put nitrogen back in the soil and then follow that back up with potatoes. So um, seeing more beans in the valley, and I think that's going to continue. Um, also, we can have this conversation about climate change. Uh, I think it's important to let you know that most of my farmers don't believe in climate change, which is really interesting because you can also ask them, was the weather different from when you were a kid? And they'll say, absolutely, yes, weather is completely different, hotter in the summer, colder in the winter, but don't believe in climate change. Well, why is that? It's because climate change is this politically driven system that wants to enact change on their operations. So they're not buying into that, but they are buying into the idea that the weather is different. Beans is one of those crops that has never been grown in Skagit County in a large number. So we're seeing this push, um, and I like to call it kind of the Oregon push. So in Washington State, in Western Washington, we're now growing Oregon's crops because of climate change. And I think this is a trend that we're gonna continue to see um, over time. And I think over time, we might be growing California crops, which will even be higher value. So um, for you all, if somebody asks you about climate change, tell them that we won the climate change lottery in that um, it's really benefiting Skagit County, especially in the crops that we can grow. The next one is grass seed, valued at around three and a half million dollars. This is another one that we're seeing grow over time. Um, as you all know, the Willamette Valley in Oregon is the grass seed capital of the world. Um, they've had a couple major crop failures the last, well, two years ago, they had a major crop failure. So it's pushing more of that crop north and we're gladly accepting it. And uh, this is a great one for rotation in that you plant the, the crop and you harvest it every year. You don't have to replant. It's in the same field, anywhere between five and 10 years of production. So a lot less impact on machinery, um, better for the environment and can be a decent money maker for our producers as well. Onwards to vegetable seed production. So we're right around uh, $10 million of production for, for spinach, beets, and, um, and cabbage seed, hybrid cabbage seed. Um, so got some pictures up here for you. I get a lot of these where people will send me an image. Hey, what crop is this? Um, if you ever have an instance of that, feel free to send me a picture. I'll let you know right away what it is but uh, you might wanna commit these ones to memory as, uh, as you can go around and show people that are visiting Skagit County the diversity of crops that we have. So in Skagit County, we grow about 80 different crops of significance, and that's a real rarity. Uh, next week, I'm traveling to Iowa for the National Association of County Ag Agents. So I'll get to hang out with all of my peers there. And there's gonna be a lot of them that will come up to me and say, hey, what y'all grow in your county? And I'll start listing off all 80 and they'll, you kind of see their jaw drop, their eyes get big. And I'm like, dang, we only produce corn and soybeans and maybe sorghum. And so um, the diversity here is really special and you all should be very proud of that. Uh, number eight is Brussels sprouts with around $10.5 million of production. Uh, this one has grown over time as well. Most of the Brussels sprouts in Skagit County, they get transplanted early in the spring, harvested in December, and apparently there's a huge market for Brussels sprouts in Canada, so a good majority of them head up there. Uh, we're also seeing more consumers interested in eating Brussels sprouts. Uh, you'll see them at Costco, and a small bag is like seven or eight bucks. Um, so thank you for purchasing those and spending those dollars right here in our own community. Uh, next up is kind of a broad category, which is the organic production, $14 million. Uh, this is something that is increasing over time, is only going to continue to increase. Uh, more consumers are really 
concerned about their environment. They're concerned about what they're eating. They want to eat healthier. Um, and so they're choosing to eat organic products. Therefore, we're seeing a lot more upstarts in organic farmers, and they tend to be smaller in nature um, um, and, and younger, which is an anomaly within agriculture. So average age of a farmer is 58 years old and increasing, and these new sustainable organic regenerative producers are, uh, are pushing that number lower. Next one is eggs and fryers. So there's uh, quite a large amount of eggs that are produced in Skagit County, especially during the pandemic, they were really doing well as egg prices were skyrocketing. Um, and then if you haven't had the opportunity, I highly recommend getting a tour of Draper Valley Farms and their facility in Mount Vernon. Um, for those of you that aren't aware, they have a facility where they're hanging chickens on the kill floor and they're, they're actually processing a chicken about one every second that's running through that line. It's, things are happening really quickly. Um, those are all going into packaging, into your local stores and around the country. So, and that's right here in our backyard. Many of folks have no idea that it's even happening. So check that out if you get a chance. Number five is the miscellaneous crops. So things like bamboo, Christmas trees, dill, fennel, gourds, um, poplar trees. Big one in this category is marijuana. Um, the last statistic I saw on this one is a little bit old, but it had marijuana production at $13 million. Um, and so it's one that uh, it's, it's very interesting in, in whether or not where you're at on that particular issue, um, it's, it's growing over time. Uh, number four is field crops, so another one of those combined categories, alfalfa, barley, corn, silage, grass, uh, oats, and hay. We did have a local, um, a local industry, a malting industry that has closed its doors, Skagit Valley Malting, so that's going to leave a big hole for this particular category, but um, there has been a lot of interest in brewing as well as distilling. Uh, local products and getting those out into the marketplace. I don't think that goes away. I just think somebody else might fill that void. Uh, number three is dairy, right around $40 million of production. Um, this is an industry that's really suffered over time. So when my father and when Louie was a kid, there was 600 dairy farms in Skagit County. When Josh and I were kids, there's there was 200. Um, now for my kids, there's 13. So uh, I only see that trend continuing down that direction. I assume, you know, in a few years, maybe in a decade, I'll be back here telling you all that there's only three dairy farms in Skagit County. It's just become much more difficult on the environmental front um, when you talk about manures and dairy waste um, to, to keep in business especially at a time when dairy farms are getting larger. So I was able to tour a facility in Boardman, Oregon, and this is five, six years ago. Um, and that facility had 12,000 cows and it had three barns that were 300 feet across on the end and they went for a half a mile. Um, they have a rotary milker where the cows come on to that big circle and they take a ride on a carousel and they get milk and then they go out the backside. Um, we're also seeing more robotics being used in the dairy industry that where you don't have to have people present, um, the cows get milked on their own. So lots of changes to the dairy industry. Uh, things are more expensive in Skagit County. So hopefully this one gets to survive. Next one that's growing is the nursery greenhouse floriculture and sod industry. Uh, people really like their flowers, uh, more home improvement projects than ever. So this is an area that's really growing over time. And then kind of the king of the hill is our potato industry. Uh, this has really been holding up agriculture in Skagit County for the last 30, 40 years. Um, it did really well in the pandemic. Uh, potatoes got really hard to come by in the grocery store. And so potato farmers were able to sell all of their products in fact, 
usually our potato farmers leave about a thousand or two thousand acres in the ground during the pandemic they went after in the spring harvested them and these were not good looking potatoes they were able to market everything and uh, reap a pretty good profit so um, hopefully that will push them through and help them survive the next big issue um, there's always issues in agriculture the next one that's coming at them is an epa pilot project that is really going to look at putting extra large buffers along riparian areas uh, specifically for an endangered uh, butterfly so uh, epa is taking comments on that currently and i know my ag producers are very interested in that as far as what's cool in ag the tech of course is is booming uh, things like drones things like autonomous tractors that drive themselves uh, robotics that weed um, and are looking for diseases and what have you. All of this stuff is coming to Skagit County and, uh, and, and just be aware of it and know that our farmers are making choices based on a lot of the rules and regulations that are headed their way. So kind of the overall premise is there's a lot of change in agriculture um, there's a lot of rules and regulations, but ultimately we live in a really great place. We can grow really good crops and therefore, you know, I'm going to predict that agriculture lives and survives. It's going to change. It's going to adapt, but it's going to be here for the next generation. And so with that, I'll take any questions you might have. Yes, go ahead. Oh, we're going to get you a mic. You didn't mention anything about nuts, and I've seen more uh, nut trees in the valley lately. Yes, so we do have uh, filbert production, filbert nuts, and um, yeah, I, I think there's some interest there. I didn't put it on the slide because um, they were getting $2.50 a pound uh, three years ago, and they dropped down to about 50 cents a pound this last year. So uh, we have the major, nut producer, I was talking to him and he said, yeah, there was a time he could really make a good living on 200 acres of nuts. Um, he said, you'd have to at least double that now. And he's looking at diversifying, doing his own packaging, selling local, um, really trying to mix things up to find where that sweet spot is for nuts. Um, conversely, my neighbors I, uh, was the Balsers. Now it's owned by Beth and Kevin Meenigan. Um, and they do a you pick nut stand and, and they really like it. Um, and it does help subsidize their incomes, but it, they still have day jobs. I've got the mic, Mike. Oh. Do you have a big picture of a Brussels sprout? Because my husband said it was broccoli and I said it was Brussels sprouts. And we have a $500 million bet on this. <laughs> And I really want to retire. And so if you could prove to me that that field was Brussels sprouts, and I did not see broccoli up there. Do we even grow broccoli in Skagit County? Uh, it's kind of gone away for the So it was Brussels sprouts, wasn't it? Just nod. Send me the picture. It and was Brussels sprouts. <laughs> and I'll identify it for you. Mike. So, Donnie, uh, last week there was a, a county... Uh, planning committee meeting that just went out of control. Um, can you talk a little bit about what's happening, the pros and cons of what's going on with that whole small petite uh, versus the big guys? I don't even know the details, but. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, I was thinking we were just having a good time, Mike. But, uh, <laughs> So I'll give you my side of it. And just so you know that I have a, a very strong bias, right? I'm a farm kid. I, I come from a farming family and I wanna continue to farm and, and leave that legacy here. So uh, here's what's happened. So um, Skagit County, 20 years ago, there were people that were interested in ent entering into venues. Uh, the big one is weddings. The other one is concerts, right? And it was friends of our family, what have you, friends that we know. So we let the first one, couple ones go, okay? Yeah, it's fine, it's not a big deal, it's just a couple, right? 
Well, over time, those venues have become successful. And because they are successful, other people are entering into that. However, within the Skagit County Code, for agricultural lands, there's no designation for wedding venues or concerts. So the county commissioners, the planning commission asked the Ag Advisory Board, which I serve on as an ex officio member, to, to come up with our interpretation of what the code says. Okay. Having spent a great deal of time reading through the code, I can tell you that Wedding venues, concert venues, in my opinion, are illegal on agricultural zone land. Why? Because it should be farmed. It's farm land. So with that, we made a recommendation to the Planning Commission that we would limit the amount of number of weddings and events that could happen on farmland down from 24 to 12 and um, they would have to get a permit to use those facilities. And the community lost their minds, right? Right, because there's a lot of money associated with weddings and concert venues. Um, one in particular gets $10,000 per event. They're hosting 80 events per year. So going back historically, one's okay. Now we have 13 of them on Skagit County Ag NRL, Ag NRL zoned land. That's as many as we have dairy farms. That's a problem. So now the Planning Commission is scrambling on figuring out what to do. You'll all read about it in the paper and we'll all deal with whatever they decide. Thank you. So I got a special use permit for a wedding venue at my house. No, I don't like, <laughs> I actually do, but I don't, that's not the subject of what I want to talk about. I have a 150 feet thick of clay in my eight acres and I'm growing grass out there poorly. Would that be a good uh, medium to grow this grass seed in? Yes, uh, grass seed prefers heavier soils. So yeah, okay. you might look into it. So, but if you only have eight acres, it's hard to get anybody interested in, it's hard to get things yeah. harvested and so forth, but I'll look into that. So. Yeah, on the eight acre side of things, I'd recommend you look at Viva Farms is a local organic sustainable farms and they're always looking for small parcels for their operators to farm. Viva, V-I-V-A. V -I -V -A. Oh, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. So, oh, I defer to Louie. Go ahead. You, you mentioned uh, riparian setbacks in the yeah. EPA. So we yes. just defeated uh, in the legislature the mandatory 300, up to 300 foot setbacks. Is this a federal? This is federal, oh. thousand foot. I need to know more about that and how we fight back. Appreciate it. Yeah, Don, one of the times that you were here before, you talked about a special kind of wheat that's being grown in, in the, it was like really uh, a surprise for the bread people and how is that progressing? It was doing really good until the malting facility closed their door. But um, yes, Dr. Stephen Jones, who operates the WSU Bread Lab, has developed uh, specific wheat varieties that do really well in Skagit County. Um, he's taken old genetics, combined them with new genetics, and um, he has a really robust crop with this new variety. It needs very little inputs, um, hardly any sprays. It, it's, uh, it's pretty fabulous from that standpoint of view. So um, I think it's just a matter of time, and, and it's going to get more attention. And, and we already have folks traveling from all across the country to come to the WSU Bread Lab as well as the King Arthur Flower Facility located at the port. You can take classes, learn how to use local ingredients to, gr to make some really great bakery goods. And uh, yeah, I highly encourage everyone to sign up for the classes, they are fabulous. So farmland in general in our county, is it, are we losing, losing it? Are we holding steady? What's, it, what's happened over say the last uh, 10 years? to arable farmland in our county? 
we're losing, but not as high of a rate as what you would expect given our growing county. So I would just, you know, commend the county, um, all the agricultural agents, ag agents um, that are working on this particular issue. I think, yeah, I, I'm really pleased that we still have ag here. I was just reading an article about San Juan County and, and they're really going through a lot of trials and tribulations that we are not. So I think we can hold our hand very high. We still have a 40 acre minimum that's alive and well. Um, so you have to, if you wanna build on ag land, you, there's steps that you have to go through that are pretty cumbersome for the average person to be able to build on farmland. Um, and we have a great farmland legacy program that's actually buying development uh, rights up to the tune of we've protected more than 14,000 acres in Skagit County that will never be built on. So we can be proud. I know I'm over time, but thanks so much for your questions. One more. A malting. Um, I know for a fact that a lot of the breweries in Skagit County were very proud of the fact that they were able to use the local malt to produce their beers with. Um, so I find it really hard to believe that it was they were unsuccessful in their venture. Uh, do you know the reason why they stopped producing? I, I really don't. Uh, I think the pandemic really hit them hard. Uh, I know their the price point for their product was a little bit higher than some of the cheaper products on the market. But like you said, there are a lot of people that were really proud to be able to produce an all Skagit beer. So the beer came from here, the hops came from here, it all came from right here. So I think my hope is that somebody else buys this company out and we continue to operate a malting facility in Skagit County. I think that's a real possibility. We just have to kind of wait and find out. Uh, conversely, they have not filed for bankruptcy. So that was written in the paper. They were gonna file for bankruptcy. That has not happened. So as um, far as I'm concerned, there's still a chance. Okay, thank you, Don. I talk. have a very special gift for you. So, when when you go to your conference next week, you can take this Cedarwoolly Rotary pen and really wow them. Not only with the eighty crops that we grow in Skagit County, but you can let them know that you visited and presented to the greatest club in the universe. So, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Niall, for joining us today. Thank you, Dave and Alyssa. Alyssa, good luck at WSU this fall. Um, you'll have to come back and visit and let us let us know how you're doing. Uh, and Anne's not here, so I can't say thank you, but don't forget about the Lions Club if you want to golf in September. And I know the reason that you're all here is for the joke. So here it is. So a husband and a wife were driving through rural Louisiana. As they approached Nakatush, they started arguing about the pronunciation of the town. They argued back and forth and back and forth, and then they finally stopped for lunch. At the counter, the husband asked the waitress, before we order, could you please settle an argument for us? Would you please pronounce where we are very slowly? She leaned over the counter and said, Burger King.